shines not, nor the moon, nor the stars, nor the lightning. Where is fire? Thou shining, every other object shines in this universe. It is thy light that illumines the hearts of the sages and devotees. Shine thou in our hearts, Manifest there in all thy glory and dispel all darkness and ignorance. Om Shanti 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 Peace, Peace, Peace. Our subject this morning the supreme goal of life. First I must tell you a Hindu legend. The Divine Mother, Mother Durga, the mother of the universe, has two children, Kartika and Ganesha. Kartika is outgoing and is the god of worldly success and prosperity and also is the god of warriors. Ganesha is contemplative. His mind is inward, devoted to Divine Mother. One day, the mother held a treasure of a necklace before them and she announced this, whoever amongst you would go round the universe speedily and come back to me will receive this treasure of a necklace. Kartika immediately went in a spaceship, I might say, around the universe. And of course, he was confident that he is the one who is going to get the treasure. And then Ganesha took his time, slowly went round the mother, bowed down to her, and mother gave him that treasure of necklace. Now Kartika comes back and he sees Ganesha is wearing that necklace. Now this is, this legend is rather symbolical. And please remember that both of them are children of Divine Mother. Now, I'd say Kartika represents science and technology. And Ganesha represents religion or spiritual life. Kartika probes into the outward universe and Ganesha probes into the inner universe. We all know 
perhaps within a few years, science and technology have made tremendous progress. What we might have thought as science fiction today has been achieved, as we all know. How? Men went to the moon and walked on the moon, and hundreds and millions of people all over the world witnessed that with a thrill. It was most wonderful. Now again, I believe that in course of time we shall be able to probe into many other planets and perhaps we shall be able to communicate with perhaps human beings like ourselves. Who knows? In the Ramayana of Tulasi Das, perhaps we consider that as legendary. But who knows that there is a great truth behind it? Tulasi Das says that Rama was born in this world of ours at one time, was also born in another planet. And he came from that planet. Again, we must remember that Kartika is a god of warriors. And we are all aware of this fact that there is a continuing presence of the cloud of thermonuclear destructive capacity which can destroy totally all human life from this planet. Now this is also human intelligence. It's human intelligence that has done this. And where from does this intelligence come? From God from Divine Mother. There is a fire. You can cook your meal in the fire or fire can bring devastation. It is not the fault of the fire, but the way we use Now again, I am not a pessimist. I do not believe that at any time this thermonuclear cloud will burst, because every nation is today cautious. And they begin to realize that it will be a su suicidal policy for any nation to use this power. It will destroy themselves as well. Furthermore, I see a good sign. There is a revolt of youth everywhere in the world. And apparently to us it may seem that in order to protest what 
the parents and the older people have done to this world in order to protest that we think and we know that they are behaving sometimes queerly but there is one thing that i can see that there is a rejection of materialism they find that their parents have made money are they happy and there is a demand for higher goal no matter how misled and misguided they may be but behind all that there is an element to reject materialism and demand for some supreme goal some higher goal of life so again we find that the wisdom of god ganesha is coming to the forefront and i believe a new age is beginning there's a greater urge for spiritual life amongst the younger generation now with regard to probing the un- inner universe this has already been done exemplars are not wanting there have been great spiritual giants or mystics that every religion in this world has produced they have chalked out the path for us we have only to follow now of course the in order that we can follow we must know what exactly is the goal of life is it the acceptance of certain dogmas and beliefs and doctrines is it to go out and do something can we do good to the world only with our hands and feet these are the things to consider and spiritual life our spiritual pursuit is not something blind and purposeless it is not something that we have to achieve in the next life it has a specific end to achieve and a definite goal to attain and that has to be attained in the words of the upanishads here and now not after the death of the body so the aspirant for spiritual life must think for himself clearly and definitely and understand that goal for only then the pursuit for spiritual life will be serious and meaningful now let us try to consider what that goal is perhaps 
all scriptures and all religions, without any exception, I would say. And if we consider and use our common sense, which seems to be so uncommon, we shall find, if I can put that goal, as fulfillment of one's life. Nobody can object to that ideal and goal. Fulfillment. Now again, in this connection, let me tell you something. I had an experience just a few months back. A Catholic father happened to come and visit us. And one of our nuns asked him, Father, uh, please tell us what you think as the goal of human life. And his answer was, fulfillment of human aspirations. Then I questioned him, tell me, Father, what do you mean by fulfillment of human aspirations, to find a beautiful wife, to gain prosperity and name and fame. These are human, natural human aspirations. And he was a little struck and he could not answer very well. Because when I pointed out, when you have all these fulfillment, what have you got? <clears throat> Does not frustration come in the end? So where is the fulfillment? Then he asked me, what is your idea of fulfillment? I said, fulfillment comes when we realize the eternal, the unchangeable reality amongst the non-eternals of life. When we attain that highest abiding joy in the midst of the fleeting pleasures of life. First, he said, I don't think there is any unchangeable reality. And I said, what is God? What is Christ? All that God or Christ or Atman, the Self within, names do not make any difference. And where is it? It's all within ourselves. You know, as long as you think that reality, that God, it's way out there. It reminds me at one time, you know, I opened the radio and I was listening to the minister's talk. And he said, you know how God listens to the prayers? Uh, just as you tune in the radio, so God has his radio tuned in, way up in the heaven. And your prayers reach him way up in the heaven. No. The kingdom of God is within. Low here, low there. The kingdom of God is within.
there is a story in the Upanishads. The Narada, a spiritual aspirant, went to Sanat Kumar, who was a knower of Brahman, and said to him, Holy Sir, I have studied science, logic, philosophy, scriptures. I have studied all branches of learning, but I find no peace. I have heard from people like you that he who knows the Self or God within, he overcomes grief. Grief has been my lot. Show me the way to overcome grief and find that peace which is beyond understanding. Then he began to teach him. After much discussion, he gave this truth. The infinite is the source of joy. There is no joy in the finite. The infinite is immortal. The finite is mortal. One who knows meditates upon and realizes the truth of the Self, the infinite being. Such a one delights in the Self. Revels in the Self, rejoices in the Self. He becomes master of himself and master of all the world. Slaves are they who know not this truth. Now the question is, what is the proof of the existence of this Self or Atman or God? What is the proof for the existence? Can our reason or intellect conceive of that? You know, one great seer philosopher of India pointed out that you can give proofs, even scientific proofs for the existence of God. Now again, there are other intellectuals who can come and through logic, through reasoning, can prove the non-existence of God. In fact, in India there has been a great philosopher who said, Ishara Siddhe, no God, because there is no proof for the existence of God. Now, again, where is the real proof? Scriptures? Good. We find in the scriptures Christ or Moses or Krishna and Buddha or Ramakrishna or the great seers of the Upanishads had experienced God. Does that satisfy us? When you are hungry, if I eat food for you, does that satisfy your appetite? When one is sick and I take the medicine for him, does that cure that patient? Now again, let me point out, truth is of two kinds. what is known as direct perception through the senses. The 
This is one proof. And then also, from the data given to us through our senses, we infer something which is also a proof. And this is, I say, empirical. But religion or God cannot be known or seen through the senses. And inference, yes, many philosophers in the West from the known have come to the unknown, have proved the existence of God or the Absolute. But here is the question. What guarantees there that that idea of God, it is only an idea of God that he proves, tallies with the reality of God? So there is another kind of truth, and that is the spiritual truth, and which is perceived through subtle, super-sensuous power of yoga. In the Bhagavad-gītā we read how Śrī Krishna tells his disciple Arjuna, you cannot see God with these eyes, but I shall give you divine sight. And that divine sight has to be opened. And it is possible, you see, it is latent in every one of us. That power is latent in every one of us. It has to be unfolded. And in this connection I may quote the psalmist, Lord, Open thine mind, open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Open my eyes. And the eyes have to be opened. And pray and pray with a longing, yearning heart for the truth of God. And therefore direct perception is possible. And that is the only proof for the existence of God. As the seers of the Upanishads point out, as well as great seers in other countries, in other nations, point out, I have known that. Also they tell us, ye also shall know the truth. Then only you can attain freedom and immortality. In the Upanishads we read, Brahman may be realized while yet living in this ephemeral body. To fail to realize him is to live in ignorance and therefore subject to birth and death. The knowers of Brahman are immortal. Others, knowing him not, continue in the bonds of grief. One question may arise. These who claim to have known God, seen God, they are in the minority. Very few in any age 
have come in direct contact and experience, have, have the direct experience of God. How to convince ourselves that they are not deluded themselves? Maybe Rayas was just deluded, Ramakrishna was deluded. They were insane, perhaps. We are integrated, but we have integrated personality. <coughs> and they acted and behaved like crazy people sometimes. But look at their life, their character. Pure. Look at the power behind them. So majority does not prove the truth. <coughs> Though majority can elect a president, but majority cannot elect God. <coughs> the fact that they are in the minority is because very few want that. Very few want that. My master one time said, people's minds are busy with trivial things. Who wants the real treasure? And in this connection, one time he said, we have the treasure to offer, but people come to get potatoes and onions and eggplants. Then he said, They have time, they can manage to do all kinds of worldly works. But when it comes to spiritual effort, they say, where is the time for it? In other words, what Buddha called laziness, that's the greatest sin. It is said, that through the grace of the Lord one can have this combination of these three things. Human birth, the desire for the truth of God or desire for liberation and the grace of a guru, an illumined teacher. And one thing, if one has that longing, one has that desire, then even God comes down in human form to teach him. And main thing necessary is that longing, that desire. Now, let me quote in this connection the words of Jesus. If we understand it properly, we shall find. He also says that. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. These are the two things necessary. To be born of water, to be born of water, just not by dipping into the water you get it, or even by sprinkling. 
You see, they're fighting about that, whether to spring to or to. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's what I call, in our language, initiation. You see, power is transmitted by the teacher to the disciple, in the form of a seed, as it were. We call it seed word. And the power is there. If it comes from the lips of a man of God, then as you chant that, as you utter that, then gradually you are born in spirit, You need to have, in the first place, what we call viveka, or discrimination. You have to consider, you have to convince yourself, no matter how your mind runs for the worldly things, it's natural. But you have to convince yourself that God is the only treasure. which no moth can eat, as Jesus says. And he is the one treasure. And at the same time, you have also to convince yourself, as I said, in spite of your tendencies for worldly things, you have to consider flat, stale, and unprofitable are the uses of the world. You have to come to that understanding, convince yourself. Now again, what are the methods? In this age, Sri Ramakrishna pointed out as many religions, so many paths. There is a saying, all roads lead to Rome, but Rome, to reach Rome, must be your ideal. So all religions lead you to that one goal, which is God. But God must be the goal of your life, not after death, but here and now. You don't have to be born again in the womb to be reborn, but while living here you can be reborn in, in spirit. And, if I can say, the common method is meditation, prayer, concentrated mind. To quote the words of the great seer philosopher Shankara, faith, devotion and constant union with God through prayer these are declared to be the seeker's direct means of liberation. You may believe in dogmas or no dogmas, but you need these three things, faith, devotion, and constant union with God through prayer. Pray without ceasing. Now let me explain to you. Faith means, in the first place, you have to have the working faith, that what the scriptures say and what the man of God teaches you, you have to have that working faith. And at the same time, you have to have faith in yourself. My master said to me, others have realized God 
Why can't you? That faith in yourself. And devotion means you have to have interest in that. You have to be interest, to be interested in God. And interest comes to you, devotion comes to you as you continue to think and think and think. Now this constant union with God, does that mean that we have to give up action and work, the duties of life in the world? No. True work, true action also. You have to keep your union your union with God, as Sri Krishna says, mentally resign all your action to me. Man attains to the highest perfection by worshipping me, by performing their respective duties. So consider work is worship. If your heart and soul are fixed in God. Again Sri Krishna says, all that he does is offered before me in utter surrender. My grace is upon him. He finds the eternal, the peace unchanging. Now here comes the important question. What to meditate upon? God. But what is God? Any idea, any conception of God that you may have is true. For instance, if the child says da, 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 cannot utter the word father, does not the father know? So God is Impersonal is personal. You see, ocean, formless ocean, infinite. And then again, through intense cold, icebergs floating. And these divine incarnations like Krishna or Christ or Buddha, they are also icebergs. And through them also you can reach that infinity, that ocean of bliss, that ocean of existence, that ocean of immortality. The, oftentimes people may think that personal aspect is lower. Nothing is lower. Anything that appeals to you, impersonal or personal, makes no difference. And you can choose any aspect that appeals to you. Infinite is God, infinite are His aspects. And that personal God also is impersonal. There is a saying, He who is the Son, the Ramo, who was the son of Dasaratha, is again dwelling in the hearts of all beings. Sri Krishna says, I am the Atman Self that dwells in the heart of every mortal creature, who truly knows me in manifold being everywhere present and all-pervading, dwell in my yoga that shall not be shaken of this be certain. Christ says, I and my Father are one. Then he says, he who hath seen me hath seen the Father. Whatever may be your chosen ideal, try to have constant union with him. That is, Constant remembrance of God. Pray unceasingly. As pointed out, through action also you can keep that union with God. 
In the Chanduk Gopanishad we read, when the senses are purified, the heart is purified. When the heart is purified, there is constant and unceasing remembrance of the Atman or Self. When there is constant and unceasing remembrance of the Self, all bonds are loosed and freedom is attained. How can the senses be purified? Live in the world, work, but work with the spirit of worship. There are three steps to it. First is, we must learn to offer the fruits of our action to God. You are doing something, not to gain anything for yourself, but you are offering that fruit to God. Then, if you ask for the fruit of the action, you get finite result. But this way you get the infinite, you get God. Second, Offer every action to God. Thirdly, see Brahman, see God in every action. And thus, you know, Maharaj said to us one time, do your duties in the world while taking your refuge in the Lord. And it is the life's fulfillment can come only when we realize, when we directly perceive or experience God, then also there comes the freedom from grief and suffering. This is the immortal bliss. Now, what about this world? What about humanity? Are we not selfish? Oftentimes they tell us, you, know, you meditate and also, why don't you do something for others? My master one time talked to me this truth. Meditate, meditate, meditate. And then your heart will go out in sympathy and compassion for all beings. And you will feel when there is a mo that these people are suffering for no reason when there is the mine of bliss within each one of them. And you see, as Sri Krishna points out, and as Swamiji, Swami Vivekananda and Sri Ramakrishna pointed out, God, help humanity. <coughs> Who are you to help? And what help can you offer? Many times by trying to help others we do more harm than good. But you can serve, to serve God in man. That is the idea. Humanism does not work. What did the Bible teach? First commandment, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. And then the second commandment is love thy neighbor as thyself. You cannot love your neighbor as yourself without loving God. Both must go together. Sri Krishna point out, points out, that yogi sees me, the same Lord, in all things, and all things within me. He never loses sight of me, <coughs> nor I of him. He is established in union with me, and worships me devoutly in all beings. Thank <laughs> you.
<clears throat> that yogi abides in me no matter what is mode of life. Then he says, who burns with the bliss and suffers with this suffers the sorrow of every creature within his own heart, making his own each bliss and each sorrow, him I hold highest of all the yogis. So this humanism has to be spiritualized. Then one becomes a great blessing to all mankind.